Good morning, and this is a really amazing chapter of scripture. Um, I know I may have said that before at the start of other messages, but John 6 is really very, very rich, and uh, it really will reward you to, to take time today or in the coming week uh, to prayerfully work through, and basically it's, it's jam-packed full of promises for, that are good for your soul and to pray through each promise and to make it and to kind of invite God to um, apply his promise to you would be very uh, good nourishment for your soul. And the theme of the whole chapter is actually food and nourishment. And so it's a really fun topic and food's an important part, I think, of life. I think I've seen some people have in their homes, you know, people put up little letters, words and things. I've seen people have food is life. And, well, it's a bit kind of worshipy, but it's not totally wrong, is it? Food is life. Food joins people together. Food uh, is the topic of our TV shows and the books we read and we, uh, we love to get a new recipe. We work and earn money to put food on the table. We love to travel to experience new foods and new tastes. You know, parents spend hours trying to get little children to sort of get food into them and there's the aeroplane and all that sort of stuff. And then they become teenagers and they sort of eat anything that moves and there's no food left. <laughs> I like watching uh, Gordon Ramsay. It's a fantastic kind of guy to watch in the kitchen and uh, the, the, what, it, what it takes to get three Michelin stars, it's amazing. Food is a big deal, and maybe not food is life, but we could say God has made us that um, food gives life because food gives nourishment. We truly eat to live. And so Jesus, having very intentionally performed a foodie miracle last week of the feeding of the 5,000, and then travels across the boat across the, the Sea of Galilee and goes to the synagogue, he continues teaching about that theme. And like a lot of things in John, he goes way beyond expectations. And in fact, in parts of this uh, reading, people are just like, aren't you the son of the carpenter? Like, we know your mum and dad, who, who are you? But it's, it's, it's great stuff for us who know that he is uh, part of God. And like in John's Gospel, I think Sam has said this, whenever there is a sign, it's always about Jesus' identity. So when he feeds, it's going to teach us something about his identity actually as food. And of course, um, you know, Jesus is going to say, I am the bread of life. It's fun, I think, that it's a good metaphor for salvation, that um, redemption, the whole redemptive project of God you know, saving us from ourselves and from judgment can be framed in terms of finding the right food that brings eternal life. And friends, Jesus is that food. And so I, I hope that, the, you know, there could, might be someone here today or here listening that hasn't tasted of Jesus and you'll find eternal life today in him. And for the rest of us who already love Jesus... You need daily nourishment, right? You need to, you don't just eat one meal, you know, you need, need food every day. You need, you need new nourishment, you need a direct line to Jesus. And so I hope this will be helpful as well. Now, I can't cover everything, it's kind of very hard. So by way of structure, I want to cover three main sections. Uh, firstly, the metaphor of bread, where Jesus particularly likes to talk about compare himself to that experience of Moses when that bread came from heaven um, in the desert and fed them. And he wants to say he's a better version of that. And there's lots of parallels there because he's from heaven. And then this is wonderful. The best bit, I think, is in the middle. This is sort of, I call it the meaning section, uh, verses 35 to 40, where Jesus really openly gives these wonderful promises that he, he, whoever comes to him, from whoever the Father sends to him, he will save, and it's the most comforting verses, I think, in all of Scripture. And then we go back to metaphor, and then there's a new, meta a new food metaphor, not bread, but meat. So anyway, so um, metaphor, meaning metaphor, um, that's the shape of the sermon. A bit of a sandwich, you could say. 
Now, that's a joke. I've got a worse joke coming, actually. I tried it on my wife. It just wasn't good. I'm going to do it, though. It's at the end. What must we do? They come to Jesus. And, you know, he says, make sure you work for the food that gives eternal life. Because he kind of, Jesus picks up, you guys have just followed me across the sea because your tummies were filled. You know, why are you really following me? Do you, you really realize, I, I can do a lot more than just loaves and fishes. I've, I've come to give you eternal life. And so he tells them to work for the food that endures to eternal life. And like a lot of religious people, we, we may be, be like this. Whenever you hear the word work, you think, is there a rule I'm missing in the Christian life? Is there something I, I should be doing that I'm not doing? And so they say, what, what must we be doing to do the works of God? And how's this for a, a crystal clear, simple gospel answer? This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. It's actually... Uh, outstanding and throughout John 6 whenever it talks about um, eating the food to eternal life it really just means believing in Jesus and trusting yourself in Jesus setting your heart your confidence leaning on Jesus all those sort of things uh, put your hopes entirely on Jesus and that's the works God requires and that's the food of eternal life but they keep talking in the passage, so that's worth highlighting in your Bible. They keep talking about uh, the bread and they say, well, Jesus, we're really important because our ancestors had bread from heaven. And Jesus says to them, uh, I love this in verse 32, I don't have it on the slides, but I'll read it. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. See, what's interesting here, with the foodie theme, with Jesus as the food of eternal life, there's a secondary theme about the failure of food. And throughout the chapter, the comparisons are made that you eat, but you get hungry again. Or you have good food, but it goes off. And even if you have lots of food, eventually you die. And so there's a failure of food. And Jesus, all those things are, are reversed in Jesus. You know, he's the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. By the way, here Jesus is clearly um, telling them what we already knew in that he, his beginning was not in, in the stable at Bethlehem. His beginning is eternal because he's part of God, part of the triune God. And he's come, he's been sent from the Father. And, and of course, that's the point at which they say, well, we know your parents. How can that be? So you've got to realise Jesus is, is God. And he goes on to say a bit later in, in verse 47, again comparing to the manna, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. See, they even had, they had a food that was directly from God. And, but they're now all dead. But, it says Jesus, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. It's beautiful. What if God could give us a food that was so nourishing that we would never die? Well, that's Jesus. Jesus is that food. So, friends, please uh, make sure, uh, if you're a foodie, if you like eating food, if you like the feeling of being satisfied... Feed your souls and get your eternity set straight by what are the works God requires? Believe in the one he has sent. Let your soul feast on Jesus and have assurance of eternal life. So that's the bread themes. And then we move into this meaning section. They actually say to him, give us this bread always. And Jesus keeps expanding it. He says... I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It's amazing. But then he says, I said to you that you have seen me and you do not believe. And so there's sort of tension like Jesus is promising a lot, but not many people are buying it yet. Not many people are, are eating it yet. 
is, if Jesus is really the real deal, then he ought to have a solid group of people who are saved by him. And so he goes into this section that really is really about um, a little bit about predestination, a little bit about election in a good way, about how the Father has is prompting people who are going to come to Jesus to feed on him and he's, he's going to look after them. Have a listen to this. This is uh, gold. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me and this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing or none of all that he has given me but raise it up or raise them up at the last day. People who have responded to Jesus are showing that they're people that God the Father has already picked and already prompted out of love, out of grace. And they step up to Jesus and Jesus will take care of them. You know, a, a bit later in the verse, actually, Jesus makes it really clear because he says, no one can come to me unless the Father draw him. But the main point, and the point on the slide, is that those who come to Jesus, not one will be lost. Not one will be lost. And Jesus will make sure that happens, not just because he loves you, but because he wants to do the will of the Father. And he sees you as a gift from the Father to him. So there's sort of this Trinitarian thing going on. It's quite beautiful. Jesus will be the perfect food in fact, our verse 40 is very helpful. This is the will of my Father that I will do, says Jesus, that everyone or anyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So friends, just be very clear. I'll put it back on the screen. Jesus is doing this. He doesn't want to lose anyone that the Father has given him. So our salvation is now wrapped up in this relationship between the Father and the Son, where the Father has gifted us to the Son, and the Son is going to look after us because he wants to do the will of the Father. It's, it's quite amazing. I, I remember a time in my life when this verse really impacted me very helpfully. When I was at Melbourne University in the mid-90s, I think it was 95, I remember very well, I had some people speaking into my life who were telling me, Wayne, you're not good enough as a Christian. They just kept, they, they literally were saying, Wayne, you are not doing enough as a Christian. Uh, very, very unhelpful people. And we always actually have a little voice in our head, don't we? That I do, that's saying, you're not doing enough for Jesus. You're not doing enough. And I was just crushed by these external voices from these bad friends and from the, the same accusations in my own head. And I suspect there's a little bit kind of dem demonic in that as well, isn't there? That, that Satan is the accuser and loves to try and make Christians think they're not doing enough for Jesus. Anyway, I, I remember the location because I was doing honours in computer science at Melbourne Uni. And we had these desks with these big fat, they were called VT100 terminals. They were computers, but they only had green text. They didn't even have like m m mice. So I'm, I'm that old. <laughs> and... Uh, I just remember, like, had my Bible open to this passage on my terminal, like on the, on the keyboard, and I remember just thinking, you know, hang on, Jesus says, whoever comes to the Father, he won't lose any of them. And I just, I don't know what it was, maybe, I think it was the Holy Spirit. I, I prayed to Jesus, I said, reading this, I said, Jesus, will you do your job? Will you do the will of the Father and not lose me? And as, from that, I think it was like a turning point in my Christian life. And the sense of assurance I felt, because my salvation was wrapped up in the Son doing the Father's will, it was not dependent on my will. It was dependent on the Son doing the Father's will. That whoever comes to him, and I was coming to him, that I, I would not be lost Friends, it's very sweet promises. I hope you make them your own. I hope you can get the comfort from them that, that I still get. Well, um, we've looked at Jesus' bread. Here is the promises of what he will do if you taste of him, if you believe in him. 
But Jesus wants to change now the metaphor, and he's got a new food in mind, and the food is meat. Because none of this can happen. Food to eternal life and never thirst and never hunger again and never die again. None of this can happen without a sacrifice. And so verse 51, uh, I don't have a slide, but verse 51 is very helpful where Jesus combines uh, the bread and then he moves into meat sacrifice. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, you see, we all, know, we all take for granted that Jesus is headed for the cross and the cross is an atonement for sin. But they didn't know that the people with him and he's unfolding this very carefully and John as the gospel writer is unfolding this very carefully for the reader and so it's going to become clearer and clearer in John that Jesus mission is not just incarnation not just revelation but his mission is 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 God incarnate to go to the cross for our redemption the bread that I will give for the life of the world Jesus is going to give up himself give up his flesh for the life of the world. And so somewhat obscurely, though clear to us, there's then a whole section about where Jesus kind of goes cannibal and he's like, you have to drink my blood, you have to eat my flesh. And of course, it's talking about trusting in the cross, trusting in the cross. Let's let's just look at one, one, one example. The Jews disputed among themselves and said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. The idea is that... um, Meat, flesh and blood, is an image of the atonement, of the great sacrifice that Jesus made, his life for ours. He took our punishment. And so uh, to believe in the atonement is to, in a way, eat the flesh. To believe that his blood was shed for you and therefore have forgiveness, that's a way by faith of drinking his blood. Do you see how that kind of plays out? The Christian is supposed to be a person who delights not just in Jesus incarnate but in Jesus Christ crucified. And this is how you actually as a Christian can grow and nourish and feed your soul by meditating on the atonement. You know, you can can thank God in in a quiet time for lots of things but I hope that you get to the cross and rejoice in the cross in a fresh way every day. You can adore God for many attributes and many perfections of God, but adore God that he sent his son to die as an atonement for you. You know, if, if you just adore God for those other things, you're not feeding on his flesh and blood enough. But as soon as you start adoring him for the cross, then it's nourishing your soul. You know, you can sing, we can sing worship songs about many topics that are all very spiritual and good, but we always want to sort of try and come back to praising and singing about the cross. Friends, even the way that you listen to a sermon, and uh, you should be looking to hear for promises and hear for the scriptures on the screen and own them in a way that you're being nourished by Jesus the bread and by the cross, his meat his flesh and blood. Let me share with you what um, my hero, J.C. Ryle, says about this chapter. I think he nails it. John chapter 6, he says, What it's talking about is an inward and spiritual act of the heart and has nothing to do with the body. Whenever a man, feeling his own guilt and sinfulness, lays hold of Christ and trusts in the atonement made for him by Christ's death, at once he, quote, eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood. Does that make sense? 
Because remember, go back to what Jesus said. What are the works God requires? To believe in the one he has sent. To set your heart on the one who was sent and what he did for us. So friends, uh, everyone needs to feed on Christ. If you don't, you, you'll be a gaunt Christian. You'll be an emaciated Christian. You have to come to Jesus directly and not sort of rarely, but often, daily, and get nourishment on him. You have to enjoy him. You have to lean on him, lean on his cross. You know, the atonement is the best food there is. And so let's put the two, let's put the two foods together. What do you get? Jesus is the bread of life and his meat, bread and meat. Je think of Jesus as the great kebab of salvation, meat and bread. That's my bad joke. <laughs> it's my favorite food. He, he is the one that's come from heaven to give you food. And no, no going through the motions will feed your soul. No, you have to nourish, you have to eat. No, you know, vague half-heartedness in the Christian life, you know, vague church attendance, that kind of thing, perfunctory kind of prayers. You have to feed on Christ. You, you have to, you know, lean on him and, and make, make what he's done for you your own. But friends, in doing so, you will never thirst, you will never hunger, and eventually you will never die and you will live forever in Christ. Because that's the kind of food he is. Let, let's pray to him, and as I pray, let's come to him and feed on him. Lord Jesus, we ponder your atonement, your great uh, giving up of your life for us, and uh, we, we take it and make it our own. We rely on it. Please forgive us because of it. We lean on it, and we rejoice in it, and we delight that the, for the assurance that having come to you, you will never uh, lose those who come to you and that you see us as a gift from the Father and that for the Father's honour, uh, you, you will never cast us away, uh, but you will see us into eternity. So Lord Jesus, be our delight, uh, be our spiritual food. Amen.